Well, praise the Lord. We are so thrilled to be here uh, with you tonight, and we've looked forward to this very, very much. Um, and I, it's been, maybe we're trying to figure out how long it's been since we've been here, maybe six years, maybe seven years, something like that. But there's a scripture portion that's been on my heart today that I, uh, for you that I just want to share, and that is in First Samuel, in First Samuel chapter 13 and then chapter 14. And in chapter 13, the, uh, the, the, the Philistines, the, the enemies of God's people, went out on raiding parties and, and went in three different directions. And the Israelites were so greatly over, over, uh, outnumbered and overwhelmed. And then there's a story in chapter four, 1 Samuel 14 of Jonathan and his armor bearer. And it sounded like, it sounds like one of the worst ideas in the world. But Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's go up to the camp of the enemy. Let's go up and show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, come up here and we'll show you something, then let's go. God has given us the victory. But if they say, stay where you are and we'll come to you, we'll stay right where we are. And his armor bearer said this. His armor bearer didn't even have a sword. He did not even have a weapon. But he said to Jonathan, go and do do all that's in your heart. I am right here with you. And they went and they showed themselves to the enemy. The enemy said, come on up here and we'll show you something. And they climbed up. And they had a tremendous victory. But the reason they had a victory, just Jonathan, maybe with a sword, his armor bearer, no sword at all, totally overwhelmed by the enemy. The reason they had victory is because they were in unity. And what they said was, nothing restrains the Lord by saving, from saving by many or by few. And God does not need great resources, or he does not need great numbers to have great victories. And I just want to leave that with you today. Nothing restrains the Lord. Nothing can hinder the Lord by giving victories, whether through many or through a few. God gives victories when there is unity and then there is his power. And so I just want to say, God bless you. And uh, we, we pray and we hope that in every life, in every place here and, and, and throughout, throughout Erie, that there will be great victory wherever you go. God bless you. Well, it is our joy to be with you again and to just to be able to uh, go to many of the Zion Fellowship churches that we haven't been to in many, many years. We were locked up on our ZMI campus uh, on the outskirts of the capital for over two years. The Philippine government was not allowing senior citizens or those under 18 to leave their houses for two years. If, if you think it, you had it bad here, uh, just you praise the Lord. You weren't in the Philippines, okay? Because there were some very significant difficulties all through that time. But the Lord is seeing us all through, and let's see what God is going to do. And I'd like to share with you some uh, thoughts from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the first six verses, that was written by King Solomon, And he was teaching there wisdom for business, for accomplishing things in life, and for us, we can say, for ministry. And we can see that Solomon was well qualified to give advice for success. He had the biggest building projects that anybody had seen uh, up to that time in history, Now, when we built our ZMI Bible School in the Philippines, we had up to 60 workers at a time. The Bible says Solomon had 183,000 workers going all at the same time as he was building his great temple. 
I don't know what kind of food orders they needed to feed 183,000 hungry workers, but he really had to be a business genius. He also, we can read, uh, had many international businesses. He had a fleet of ships that went out for three years' journey out into the far corners of the earth, probably to India, and brought back uh, the unusual uh, treasures of, of Asia. He ruled over an empire that includes all or part of seven nations today. This was a man that was an organizational genius, and God used him to be uh, to declare his praise in his wonderful kingdom at that day. Now, while he gives advice for us in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, while it can be applied naturally to business, I don't know if we have any business owners here tonight that need business advice. You can read it for its natural wisdom. But we want to look, as Jesus, when he was 12 years old, said, was, and when he was in the temple, he said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? We have a work to do for God. Each of us has been given uh, time, years of health. We've, we've got certain abilities and resources that God has given us that we can use uh, for the glory of God, for the betterment of his people, as well as for ourselves and our loved ones. And as God has given us these many things, how are we to use them? Well, let's read Solomon's business wisdom, or we can say his ministry wisdom. Song of Solomon 11.1, 1, Solomon wrote, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Cast your bread. Spread your business investments. Don't put everything in one pocket, or there might be a hole. But spread and cast your bread upon the waters, here it says. And spiritually, we can interpret this. In the Bible, we repeatedly hear of bread referring to the word of God. In the tabernacle and temple, they had a table of bread that was typifying there being fresh bread or the fresh word of God every day. As we read our Bibles, as we study, we want to have spiritual bread. And Jesus, of course, was the bread of life, and he came from Bethlehem. Bethlehem is two Hebrew words, Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. So we want to be able to give the word of God. We want to be able to give the life of Jesus to other people. And it says, cast your bread on the waters. What do the waters mean? Well, we're not trying to feed ducks by throwing little breadcrumbs, no. But in the scriptures, in Revelation seventeen fifteen, an angel says to the apostle John, the waters that you see are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. There is an interpretation. When we cast our, the bread of the word of God upon the waters, we are to cast it to the nations, to the peoples, to the multitudes. And as we do it, we are told, you will find it again after many days. It will return to you. And so we want to invest in spreading the word of God afar. I can remember once I was conducting a pastor seminar in the central Philippines. And uh, I had a new study Bible that I brought. And in the middle of the seminar, I, I just felt... Uh, at the end of the seminar, I should give my study Bible. Uh, there's a young man there that uh, I just think I should give him the study Bible. So I did. I offered it at the end of the seminar. He looked like thunderstruck him or something and, and couldn't believe it. And, well, do you want it? He, yes! Okay, and went away very happy. A year later, I had a pastor's seminar there again. And he attended, and he told me his story. He had been the teacher, uh, a teacher at a public high school, that was his job, and a teacher, a Sunday school teacher at his church. When the Lord had been speaking to him that he should resign his profession and launch out to become a full-time pastor. But he had argued with God, God, I can't be a pastor. I've never been to Bible school. But the Lord reminded him, Jesus never went to Bible school, you know, John the Baptist never went, you know, and all the, Moses never went to Bible school, Elijah, and so he eventually said, okay, Lord, yeah, that's not really necessary, but Lord, 
I don't even have a study Bible. He was arguing with God all through the seminar I conducted. He couldn't become a pastor because he didn't have a study Bible. Well, God answered that question at the end of the seminar. And so he quit his job. He became a pastor. And one year later, he said, he had a church of 70 people. And they had just bought all of the building materials, debt-free. And they were starting to build their church building. Now, if you cast your bread on the waters... And it comes back after many days. That's pretty quick for one Bible to produce a church of 70 people in one year. That's, uh, if, if I could do that all the time, you'd see me walking around with a backpack of study Bibles. No, but it's just an illustration that God can use us in unusual ways when we're available when we're ready to share the word of God, when we've got a, a tract in the car and we can give it to the gas station attendant or, or uh, we were just at a restaurant with the Wallaces uh, up near Elmira, New York, just uh, yesterday. And uh, Dave Wallace pulled out a Bible track and started witnessing to the waitress. And, and, she, uh, and she w- we talked for about 10 minutes. And uh, it was wonderful to see how open she was to just hear about Jesus. Cast your bread on the waters. It might come back in a year or it might take many days. I remember I was in, last time I was in India in uh, Vishakapatnam. You've been there before, Pastor Dan. And I heard that there was a, a famous worship leader that was in town. And I was, he was, I was told, oh, he's, he's, he's really famous in our, this part of India. And they said, we know you wrote a book about worship, so you know, I, you're probably kindred spirits. Uh, we told him uh, about you, and, and he's going to come visit. And so they showed me a video of him. He had hundreds of of in a choir that marched into the church worshiping and and he had a built a building that wasn't a church it was a worship center where he taught and where they exemplified pure worship and so yeah I wanted to meet him he sounded like quite a, a great brother so they the time came after service they introduced me and and someone said yeah and and I mean, brother norman he wrote a book about worship too and they pulled out a copy of one of my book on worship in that local language, Telugu. And this visiting minister, the worship uh, pastor, he, he, he took the book and he said, this is my gold, this is my gold, this is my gold. And I couldn't figure that out. He said, this is the book that I've studied for 25 years. This is what has guided my ministry. This is my gold. <laughs> ah, okay, well... Keep writing those books, Pastor Dan. You don't know where they might go. You don't know what God might do if you just pass out a good Bible book. And so that one took 25 years for the, for the bread to come back. But praise God, if we will invest, if we'll give, if you'll send your pastor, okay? And, <laughs> and Pastor Frank, Pastor Frank travels around being such an abundant blessing also. You've got a deposit here in your church that is touching nations. So don't just think your congregation is small because you're more than just here. You are an international ministry touching many churches and nations. And that is going to be the fruit that you're going to see. As you are faithful to support the work of God here, then you are the castle. Well, it's it's almost a castle, right? <laughs> From which the, the, the soldiers of the Lord go forth and make victories in many places. And you're going to see after many days, maybe when you get to heaven, but you're going to see a multitude of people that are going to say, thank you for supporting Pastor Dan. Thank you for supporting all the ministry that's gone forth from the church here. After many days, it's going to come back to you as your reward, as your joy. So that's his first advice. Cast your bread on the waters. Second verse, Solomon wrote, Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Well, How can we interpret that? We could say God will protect and repay the generous. 
If we help seven people, if we help eight, if we're continually helping people, that's good because you don't know what evil might come. And if we are generous to others, then God will be generous to us. If we help others in their day of trouble, God will help us in our day of trouble. And I can remember when I was a Bible school student, 1974, I think it was, and we heard the news that there was a Bible school in some obscure island in the Philippines, and the Muslim rebels were advancing to that area, and there was... They were causing a lot of trouble, and the missionaries there asked, pray, pray that the Muslim rebels will be stopped. And, and so we prayed in that prayer meeting, and a few minutes later, everybody trooped off to lunch. It was lunchtime. I stayed and prayed, and I prayed and prayed, Lord, you've got to stop those, those Muslim terrorists. Lord, you've got to, to protect the missionaries. And I prayed until I felt there was victory. What I didn't know was 10 years later, My wife and I and our little two-year-old daughter would be at that exact Bible school and the Muslim terrorists were advancing again. And they kidnapped all the other foreigners around us. They didn't kidnap us. Give a serving to seven, to eight. You don't know what evil will be on the earth. And we heard later that there were local people that the uh, rebels were trying to win to their side, but they would all say, don't you touch those missionaries. Don't you touch them. They're good people. They help us. They're, they're good to the community. And so God protected us in a time of trouble. So, uh, do we live in troublous times? <laughs> well, then we better follow this advice. Be generous to seven, to eight, to ten, to, to thirty, because we don't know what evil might come on the earth. Now let's look at verse 3, where Solomon then said, If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Okay, Solomon, you're, you're always using picture language and giving obscure riddles. What does this mean? For, uh, for ministry wisdom, for our service. I would suggest we could say, your ministry and eternal reward is determined by your character. Our character, who we are, determines what is going to be produced from our lives and what will become our eternal rewards. We find in the book of Job, Chapter 29, verse 23, that Job said the people waited for him as for the rain. They opened their mouth as for the spring rain. Job was a blessing everywhere he went. And as he went and and, and was generous to the poor and and did many good works, uh, the people just just said, "Here's, here's someone full of blessings. Just like Solomon said, if the cloud is full of rain, it's going to rain. Okay. People, they give empty promises of help. They're like clouds that have no rain. The Bible says in another place. But let's be full rain clouds. Let's be full of the love of Jesus. And let's reach out and help people. If the only thing we can still do is pray for people, then praise God. We can still pray for people. There were times when my wife and I were being generous and trying to help people with great needs in the Philippines, and and we just couldn't help anymore with anything that we owned or could get, but, but we would always remember, but we can still pray. We can pray God's blessing. We can help them. We can encourage them. And so God will protect and will let what the rain that comes from our life, what we produce, is going to be ministry and share the love of God, and will bring us eternal reward. But it's determined by our character. Now, trees are many times not perfectly upright. They usually lean a little one way or the other way because they grow towards the sunlight. And in a forest, 
There's a lot of trees, and so they'll, they'll lean a certain way to get more light. And so trees grow up, usually leaning a little bit. And as they get older, they might lean more and more and more. And when they're very old and ready to drop, they drop in the direction that they were pointing. And so Solomon said, in the direction that the tree was falling, there it will lie. And that to us can speak that our lives, we are leaning. We have purpose and goals for each of our lives. And as we continue on in life, those goals will be stronger and stronger that, that we, of something that we want to accomplish, what uh, we want to, you know, build up our families, help our kids, our grandkids, or, or uh, support the church and, and its missions, or uh, whatever might be the goals of your life. If we're leaning and leaning and leaning, then we're going to, when we end our life, that's the direction Our life will point eternally. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And however we have leaned, however we have uh, uh, ordered our life, then that is going to determine our eternal reward. Because we will reap the fruit of our life. Just as a tree that falls will stay there forever. As long as it's a tree, it's going to be, it falls there You don't easily change the direction of a fallen tree. And so we want, by God's grace, to let our character always lean us forward in good directions. That we have goals for our life. We we have goals for our family. We have uh, repeated prayers that we're praying. And and, and Lord, let the prayers become like a a dam full of water, Lord. And in your timing, the dam's going to break. And you're going to answer All of those prayers that have built up. There was a missionary or a lady that wanted to be a missionary when she was young. Her name was Mary Slusser. She lived in Scotland. And she wanted to be a missionary, but she was, her health wasn't the best and she didn't have a great education and she was turned down by the missionary societies. But they said, well, if you want, you can join a, 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 a local a missions work right here. We help the poor. We evangelize right here in our own city. Uh, you, can, you can join that work if you want. And so she did. And she excelled for speaking about the Lord Jesus to people and reaching out to the poor and, and even the, the dangerous people of society. She would boldly go up to them and witness. And as they saw that she had real effect in her life, a missions board eventually accepted her to go down to Africa. And at that time, this was 180 years ago, perhaps, at that time, missionaries were only along the coastal big cities of Africa. They hadn't penetrated far inland yet. Uh, there wasn't any society back there. They were, they were warring tribes back in the interior of Africa, and so the missionaries just stayed on the, the coast where there was soldiers and there was decent order. Mary Slusser, when she got to Africa, went right back into the jungles. And one thing she very quickly noticed was any woman that gave birth to twins, they considered it in their culture a curse, something horrible to have two children at the same time. And so the women, if they gave birth to twins, would leave them out on a jungle trail to die of exposure or be eaten by wild beasts. They were, they were a curse that they got rid of. And when Mary Slessor would find abandoned baby newborn twins on a jungle trail or hear about it, she would go and she would take them and uh, adopt them. And she had an orphanage and then another, then another orphanage where she raised up all of these young boys and girls and taught them. And then sent them to get educations. And they became many of the leaders of that area because Mary Slusser helped lift them up to uh, better education. And, and so she single-handedly stopped the killing of twins by people seeing these were valuable people. These are doctors. These are educated people. They're, they're teachers that are teaching in our, uh, and we've never had schools before, and, and here they were abandoned as a curse, but now they're such a blessing. Single-handedly, she stopped 
the killing of twins. She sometimes would find warring tribes that were getting ready for war and were yelling at each other and yelling and yelling. And They had big rituals before that actually attacked. She actually stood at times between two tribes yelling at each other, shaking their spears and getting ready to fight. She would stand between them and tell them to stop and ask, what is their problem? And the leaders would come out And she would negotiate and many times brought peace to those warring tribes. And wherever she went, she would start a church and a school. Then she'd go to another village, start a church and a school. And she became the counselor and the peacemaker for all the tribes in that area of Central Africa until for 1,000 miles around, she was acknowledged and honored, they called her the Queen of Calabar. That was the name of the interior of Africa, right there. And when the British Empire was, uh, was uh, exercising its control, was, was developing its outreach back into the interior of that part of Africa to try to colonize or civilize them, uh, the, they, they had a discussion. Uh, who will be the who will be the governor of this part of Africa? Who, who will we appoint uh, to represent the British Commonwealth? And some suggested a famous general, someone else a famous statesman. Someone else said, you don't need to appoint, you don't need to find a new person and bring him here. We've already got an Englishman, an English lady that's already ruling all this area that all the people honor and respect and obey. And so for the first time in the history of the British Empire, they appointed as a governor a woman to be the governor. She was already ruling, you know, but but they gave her that honor and they gave her that authority and she used it for the betterment of the people. And so here was a lady that made great impact wherever she went. And when she was very old, some people said, you know, Mary, you're you're getting infirm and you're slowing down some. Uh, You know, you've done so much for so many years. You've battled through so many sicknesses. You should, you know, we'll buy you a ticket back. You can go back to your uh, native land of Scotland and and you can just enjoy your last few years there in peace and just rejoice And she said, what? Go back to Scotland? Go back where I can't do anything? And they said, well, you just finished your mission in this area. You've got your church. Where are you going to go if not Scotland? Her answer was, anywhere as long as it's forward for the gospel. Anywhere as long as it's forward. She was a leaning tree. And when she eventually fell in death... She is now entered into a great eternal reward because her whole life was pointing her towards, towards accomplishing something of value that would last far beyond just her earthly years. And so let's learn to have godly character and motivation and goals in our life. Let's be trees that lean more and more as we get older. Yeah, the tree will fall sometime. But in the meantime, make sure it's leaning in the right direction. Not just leaning towards heaven, but leaning towards an abundant entrance into heaven. We read in 2 Peter chapter 1. People can get to heaven and barely get in, saved by the blood of the Lamb, and praise God for every soul saved. But some people will have very little eternal fruit. But what about someone that gave a tract to the right person? There was an Indian boy that had one rupee, one coin, and he heard about missions, he gave it, and they bought a track, and they, and they knew who they gave the track to. It got to the chief of an Indian tribe. He turned to Christ reading that track and turned his whole tribe to Christ. One rupee, which today is about, about two cents, brought a whole tribe to Christ. What can we do as we're led by the Spirit? as we're motivated by the heart of God. Who can we speak to and plant words of life? What can we do? As my wife exhorted from 1 Samuel, God can deliver, when bring victory, whether it's by many or whether it's just by one man with a sword. Hold your swords up high, brothers and sisters. 
Hold the sword of the word of God up high. Send your pastors out to hold the sword up. And whether by few or by many, God can do wonderful, great things through you all. So let's go on and look at more advice that Solomon gives in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 4. He wrote, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Well, that's true for a farmer. If a farmer says that, you know, it's hot wind and it's sunny and, you know, if we sow the seed now, it's all going to get burned over. There's no water. It won't, it won't grow. He might not feel like sowing the seed that day. Or what if he's looking at the clouds in harvest season and saying, if I cut down the grain now and it rains, it'll all get turned rotten. Now, this probably isn't a good day to harvest. So, what happens if someone is just looking at natural difficulties or obstacles. They'll be hindered from getting anything done. So Solomon's advice here is, we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't look at the obstacles and let them stop us from doing something for God. The farmer who waits for the perfect weather will never get a harvest. And if we wait for perfection... We'll never get a harvest. You know, the first time my wife tried to uh, evangelize uh, with a friend, they had an idea that they would go to Eastview Mall, just south of Rochester, if any of you have been there, just a big mall. And it was Christmas time, and they got the plan that Linda would uh, carry some presents and, or, or boxes that looked like wrapped up Christmas presents. They were empty, I think. But carry them. And then in the middle of the mall, she would throw them in the air and say, Christmas! Oh, shopping! Oh, there's so much! Bye, bye, bye! You know, and just, you know. And then the person that was supposedly her husband would come up and say, Oh, but dear, you know, Christmas is supposed to be all about Jesus. And he would calm her down and, and, you know, preach the gospel to anybody listening to this all. Well, that was a good plan. So when they tried it, and my 17-year-old beauty that has learned much wisdom since, okay, threw the packages up in the air, Christmas, what's this all about? Foom, foom, foom. Security guards came from everywhere and, and took her and said, that's all right, ma'am. Uh, we'll, we'll call the ambulance now. Uh, don't worry about this, you know. If you need a sedative, you know, we'll, we'll just help you stay calm. They were going to cart her away. <laughs> and her, luckily her theoretical husband came up and said, oh, honey, oh, you know, is this, is this too much shopping? And he said, don't worry, uh, sirs. Uh, I'll take her home now. Don't worry. She'll be under good care. And he, he took her away. D- did you leave the boxes there on the floor, on the ground? I, I'm not sure I heard the rest of the story. Well, I'm sorry. This isn't one of the more glorious stories about her accomplishments. But I just say this, that that was the first time she tried evangelizing like that. But she has evangelized now for 45 years And she has led countless people to Christ. She wasn't discouraged by the first time not working so well, okay? And have you ever tried to do something and it didn't work? Well, is that going to stop us? Or will we learn from our mistakes? Let's go on in God. Let's not walk by sight. Walk and be hindered by the obstacles around us. Trials and difficulties can test us, but they can't stop us if we're in the will of God and we keep moving forward. I can remember the first time that I was organizing a large pastor's seminar in the central Philippines. And just a week before the seminar was to start, there was a big commotion in Manila, the capital, where a large group of the military staged a coup, uh, a revolution against the government. And in this time, the government called for some troops from up north to come down to support her, and they turned against her. 
So uh, the president was a woman, and, and so there's confusion. Who is for the president? Who's against? So they ordered all the military to stay locked down in their bases. Nobody could move outside of the bases as they were trying to sort out what was happening in this, in this coup attempt. And while this was happening, just the week before I was going to go do the seminar, at the place I was going to hold the seminar, I read in a newspaper that the local president of the biggest university in that city had just been machine gunned down in broad daylight in the center of his campus by the communist rebels because the military couldn't come out and get them. And then I flew there, and then the pastors gathered around and said, Brother Norman, we've got to tell you, this is a very difficult time for us. Just a week ago, on Sunday, a, a pastor was preaching at his church, and he said, God loves the communist, but he hates communism. Now, have you ever heard the saying, God loves the sinner, but hates the sin? You've heard that? Well, this pastor just changed it around a little, made it, God loves the communist, but hates the communism. And at the end of his message, a visitor came up to him and said, Pastor, uh, that was, that was quite a sermon you had. Uh, listen, uh, I'm going to see you later this week and give you a present. Watch for me. I'm going to give you a present. And three days later, as the pastor stepped off of a bus, as was his common daily routine, this man was waiting for him at the bus stop with a paper bag. And out of the paper bag, he said, uh, here's the present for you. He pulled out a pistol and shot the pastor dead. This happened just, a, just I think, two days, three days before I arrived. And the, the leaders of the pastors in that city said, uh, Brother Norman, whatever you do, don't use the C word for communist, okay? And I said, I will respect that. But whatever God tells me to preach, I, I will preach. I just, I'll be careful not to use the word communist. So God gave me a prophecy the first morning of the first day of the seminar. And in that prophecy, it was that the Lord told all the pastors there, 250, 300 pastors, that if they would stand against the darkness in the land, that God would give them a breakthrough. And everybody knew, I didn't have to use the C word, everybody knew who the darkness in the land was. So, at the end of the day, as I was walking out the door, Uh, Some pastors were there to greet me, and one said, uh, good preaching, brother. Another said, that was anointed, and, uh, you know, I loved loved your preaching. And then the last person in line uh, shook my hand, and he said, uh, uh, that was an interesting spiritual lecture. And immediately, I thought, pastors don't talk like that. Interesting spiritual lecture. You know, that's not the lingo for a pastor. And so I thought, he's not a pastor. I looked at him. I don't even think he's a Christian. And he had big black sunglasses and couldn't see most of his face. But as I tried to look in and see his face, by the discerning of spirits, God let me see through his eyes, down into his heart, murder and anger and hatred. And I realized he was a communist spy. So... Then we started to talk, and he was waiting there just to ask, uh, are you going to be at the uh, evangelistic crusade tonight in the city plaza? The city plaza was a large cement stand uh, out in in the plaza area, open on all sides, uh, floodlights flooding the the pedestal, the the stage, uh, and then you couldn't see anything in the darkness because all the lights were shining at you. We... uh, It ended up many hundreds of people coming, but you could only hear some noise. But I said, yes, I'm not preaching. My friend is, but I'm going to go to support him. He said, good. I just wanted to tell you, I have a present for you. I'm going to see you tonight, and I'm going to give you your present. Watch for me. And I asked him, "Uh, where are you from, sir? And he said, Sabundok, from the mountains. And it was up in the high mountains that the communist rebels uh, wandered and lived uh, to escape the military. And their, their name was the NPA, the New People's Army. 
But what we called them, the NPA, was No Permanent Address, NPA. Okay? He, was, he just lived up, Sabundo, up in the mountains somewhere. And the more I talked, the more I was... And he just kept repeating, I'm going to see you tonight. I've got a present for you. And I didn't want that present. <laughs> so I talked to the local pastors, and they said, Oh, oh, uh, let's call the military. And the military said, Sorry, we're, we're ordered to base. They called the police. And the police said, well, it's just, it's just two hours now. It's late afternoon, two hours before you're gathering. You know, we can't organize a group of policemen that fast. You know, call us tomorrow morning if you want and for some future day. And so we were left alone but God. And I really struggled. Lord, I know there's an airplane flying away, just a mile away. I could, I could disappear in, in two hours before anybody knew I was, was gone. But then I had a more spiritual thought. Well, maybe I'll tell them I won't go to the evening crusade because I'm teaching in the next day and I've got to stay in my hotel room and study. <laughs> that one sounded much more enticing. But I had promised the brother that I was going to go support him. I told everyone. And if having a death threat, I would put my tail between my legs like a dog and run off and hide, then... What would happen to my prophecy that if they would stand against the darkness in the land, they would have victory? So I thought, if if my preaching, if my prophesying is going to be of any good, I better be a doer of the word. And I prayed and prayed and prayed till I felt God would stop the man. I prayed he'd find a a, a relative died and he had to quickly go or or help get medicine. I prayed uh, he'd have diarrhea and wouldn't be able to get to the to the evening crusade. You know the prayers of a desperate man. But anyhow, he didn't come. And the next day he didn't come to the seminar. The third day he didn't come to the seminar. And I was never so happy that you know seminar attendance went down a little bit. You know. <laughs> And so we accomplished our mission, and it encouraged several of the pastors there to go out and conduct further evangelistic crusades. And many thousands of people got saved in the next few years. It broke the back of the communist rebellion in that island, in that province. And two years later, I was invited back to start a ZMI Bible school there, for 120 pastors and Christian workers, most of which had gotten saved in that revival after the seminar. And we held the Bible school for several years. Uh, We conducted it at a church of a lady that back when I had first gone, when the communists were assassinating many people, she had been part of the hit squad that was assassinating people. And two years later, she was a pastora with a large church. And at our church, she let us use it to train up all of the pastors. What do we do when hindrances come? Well, if by God's grace, we can keep going forward, God can give mighty breakthroughs. Don't be discouraged by the difficulties. Don't just say, well, we're such a little church. Uh, But you've got God with you. And with God on your side, anything is possible. Wait and see what God is yet going to do with the people that pray, that worship, that, that invite God to come. And so when I survived that test, that first pastor seminar, and, and spoke the word of God and, and lived it, from that time God opened up the doors to many nations for me to conduct pastor seminars. If I had failed of the grace of God and been afraid and retreated at the first one, I'm sure the door would have been shut. I wouldn't have been able to be effective leading the pastors if I ran in the time of pressure. Let's be people that hold our ground, that go forward in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Ephesians 6 that we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that uh, stand in the evil day. And having done all, keep standing. In a battle, the one that stays standing at the end of the battle is the winner. So sometimes all we have to do is keep standing. Keep praying, keep fighting, keep stay faithful, and whatever you do, 
Still be standing. Still stay in your position. The battle will be over and there will be victories, great victories in the years to come. Now let's go on and look at the fifth of the six business wisdoms of King Solomon in verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Well, Solomon, how do we figure out your obscure wisdom here? May I suggest we can interpret this. That God's works have invisible and small beginnings. We don't know the way of the wind. We don't know how a child starts to grow in a mother's womb. It's small. It's invisible. It's nothing we can, until modern technology, it's nothing we could analyze or observe. And God so often starts in very small and invisible ways. And we need to appreciate when God starts something, even when it starts very small. The smallest acorn can grow a huge oak tree. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, smallest of of herbs, but when it grows up, it can become greater than all the others, starting from something very tiny. And so we want, by God's grace, to first of all, we don't know the way of the wind, but when the wind is blowing, let us learn to discern it. Let us learn to see how God is moving, what God wants to do. A sailor needs to be able to observe the wind and learn to guide his ship, navigate the ship with the wind or sometimes even against the wind if there's adversity. But to learn the invisible, the moving of God's spirit as the wind of God. And things that are growing, that start out so small. God puts a burden or an idea or a vision in our heart or mind of something that we could do. And, and it just starts out as a little idea, just a little seed. Just, but, but spiritually speaking, we become pregnant. Okay, there's something growing within us, a word, a seed of God that starts to grow in our heart of, of something that can get done. When we started our first ZMI Bible school in the Philippines, God had given me a vision, and I saw the multitudes that would come from the nations, and God was going to do great things. So we got really excited, and two years later, started the Bible school with four students showing up. That didn't look like the glorious vision I saw. But we started, and it slowly grew until it was, uh, for many years, it's uh, been mostly 70 students at the main school, and uh, five, six hundred students in all at all of the extension schools. But when we had started, the Lord spoke to my wife and told her, you have had three premature babies. And she said to the Lord, Lord, our daughter Rebecca was premature and our other daughter, Esther, she was premature. Three premature babies? I, I only had two. And then the Lord spoke to her and said, your third premature baby was the ZMI Bible School. We started it a little too early. We should have prayed more and waited for God's timing. But just like a child, if it's not born too early, can still grow properly. Uh, So something birthed of God, even if we're a little premature, it it still grew and, and has been very successful to where we've had ZMI Bible School extensions in about eight Asian nations and seen many thousands of people trained to serve the Lord as pastors and Christian workers. But it had such a small beginning. We could have given up. Actually, at one point, we, we, uh, we mailed Pastor Bailey and said, Pastor Bailey, uh, the school is so small and we're fruitful in seminars and books and this and that. Can, can we discontinue the Bible school? And Pastor Bailey prayed, and he wrote us back and said, Don't stop the Bible school. God has great purposes for it. You're going to see it greatly grow. And we didn't see it. It wasn't observable. But we walk by faith, not by sight. And we respected what Brother Bailey uh, had heard from God. And so 
we have seen the work of God getting bigger and bigger. And to your fruit also, as you are one of the churches that pray and support us. Let's go on to the last verse here that Solomon was giving business wisdom. Verse 6 of Ecclesiastes 11. He said, in the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will prosper. So this is his encouragement that we are to be diligent and optimistic. Sow your seed in the morning, sow it in the evening. Are the weather conditions favorable? Maybe not, but maybe this one will succeed. Maybe maybe they both will succeed. Go ahead and go forward. And so, some people never try anything new because they're afraid it might fail. But if we never try anything new, it's true, you'll never have any failures, but you'll never have any successes if you don't try something new. The Apostle Peter, when we read about him in the Gospels, he made more mistakes than all the other 11 combined. He was constantly saying the wrong thing, uh, suggesting the wrong things, and and Jesus rebuking him, get thee behind me, Satan. And once God the Father came down from a cloud of glory and said, uh, when Peter was trying to run the show, and God said, this is my son, you listen to him. Okay. Basically, politely said, Peter, shut up. Okay. And so Peter was making all kinds of mistakes, but he tried more than everyone else and he learned through his failures because he also had some successes. We can say, well, Peter tried to walk on the water, but then he was, you know, almost drowned. Yeah, he almost drowned, but how many of us have walked on water? Huh? Nobody. Try and see what God might let us do. Speak to someone that you haven't told about the Lord and see if God will be in it. Uh, pray about something new. Uh, support something. Uh, give ideas to your pastor of uh, maybe evangelism, of, of something that, that God might be in that could bring the work of God forward. Let's press on. There was a young man Back a hundred some years ago, he failed his first math subject. Would he give up on math? No, his name was Albert Einstein. Failed his first math subject. And he became known as the most brilliant uh, physicist, uh, mathematician that the world has known. There was uh, a young boy uh, who uh, was, uh, his teacher said, you'll never accomplish anything. Well, His name was Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb and and many other things. There was uh, so many stories of people that that were told they'd get nothing done. There was an artist for a newspaper. He got fired, and the newspaper editor said, he never has any good ideas. He's never going to be a success. So then he tried making a little uh, moving picture that was new technology in that time, a hundred years ago, and he started a, he made a Oswald the Rabbit uh, cartoon, and it was a dismal failure, and they lost their money, and people were saying, just give up, but he kept going, and he tried again, and he came up with a new idea, and he made Mickey Mouse, and he's not a failure, his company was not a failure after that, keep trying, try this, try that, in the morning, in the evening, Cast your bread, or in this scripture, sow your seed. And so we want to sow our seed of the word of God. When we're young, in the morning of our lives, that God will accomplish great things. Even little children can become evangelists. When my oldest daughter was six years old, she led her playmate, the next door neighbor, to Christ. And she evangelized her family until the whole family turned to Christ. And he was the, uh, the president of the local university. And that made an impact on the community. When a six-year-old girl said, you're a Catholic, aren't you? 
You worship idols, right? Well, don't you know in the Bible, and six years old, she knew Exodus 20. She turned there. She read it to the girl and said, you shouldn't pray to idols. You should pray to Jesus. Do you want to pray to Jesus right now? And they prayed. And then she invited her to church. Pretty good six-year-old evangelist. Okay. In the morning of your life, cast your seed. In the evening time, the Bible says, don't withhold your hand. Even if our bodies are getting a little slower, our prayers can be as fast as ever. And we can pray around the world and see things changed and see people anointed by God and see, see uh, people rise up in God when we go forward, even in our later years. There was a man, maybe you've heard his name, George Miller. He became famous for starting some orphanages. In England, but when he was a a young teenager, he wanted to be a missionary. And he applied to mission boards and they all turned him down. He wasn't healthy enough or he didn't have good enough English or this or that. But he eventually started an orphanage that grew up to have more than 2,000 orphans that was provided for without any organization, without even one time any asking for finances. And He supported 2,000 children by faith. When he was 70 years old, people said, oh, are you going to retire now? He said, well, I've trained my successor. The Bible school can run without me. Now I'll be a missionary. And at age 70, he started his original missions calling. For 17 years, he traveled to 42 nations and preached to millions of people. Well, there's still some hope left for us, Pastor Dan. Okay, you got a little more gas in that gas tank. Okay, let's see what we can still do for the work of God. Let's see what the church here can do for the work of God. Even if, if you're old, don't withhold your hand. God can still bless it. He who sows to the Spirit, Galatians 6, 8 tells us, will reap everlasting life. We will have everlasting joy with those that we have helped grow in God. Our brother from El Salvador that I just met before the service. Well, he told me that uh, we he first met us or saw us when he was a little child. My wife and I came and we preached in El Salvador. And you use my book too? Great, great. You want more copies? <laughs> You need a Bible. You need a study Bible, brother. <laughs> uh, but what God can do when we just reach out and we volunteer to be used by God. So I want to first of all say thank you for faithfully supporting us on the mission field all these years. We've been in the Philippines for forty years, and by God's grace, we hope to stay there till Jesus comes. Whether He comes individually for us or whether He comes in the clouds for us all together. We are there, planted on the mission field. And so we appreciate your prayers, your support, and how faithful you are to keep the work of God going that is making an impact into the nations. So let's be encouraged tonight. Let's remember Solomon's business wisdom, that we can be about our father's business that God can help encourage us to go forward through difficulties, through obstacles, through uh, not maybe not looking like the right time. Uh, it's not doesn't seem to be harvest time. Yes, there are many difficulties around us, but let's see what God can do with a people that will pray and trust God and be led by the Spirit to accomplish more and more for His kingdom. Amen. And so uh, your pastor invited my wife and I that we could perhaps pray for anyone who would like prayer.